Well, good morning. If you would turn in your Bible to the book of First Timothy. Um, we are starting a new book series this morning, um, and we're going to be going through First and Second Timothy in concession. Um, so, if you'll turn there uh, this morning, we're just going to be in verses uh, one to two. I'm really excited to, uh, to do this new study. Uh, I've been wanting to preach through 1 and 2 Timothy for quite some time now, and now that we've finished Exodus, we've been going through Exodus for like 14 months, and uh, now that we've finished that, uh, we're back in the New Testament, and so we'll be in this for somewhere between a year to 10, um, and uh, we'll see how the Spirit leads us in this process. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, the title of the sermon this morning is A Father's Letter to his son. So if you will, read the text with me, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, I pray now, um, Lord, that you would speak to your people, um, that you would use uh, this weak and feeble mouth, Lord, to deliver a message of power and a message of conviction. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to prepare our hearts over the next uh, year or longer to, to learn and to grow together as a body as we examine these two letters that Paul has written to Timothy. Um, I pray you'd help us to be uh, humble and submissive to the, the, the authority and the truth of your word. I pray that you would help us to have um, clarity of thought, Lord, as we um, study this. And um, Lord, you would help me to, um, to grow as much um, as I hope the people do as I um, preach through the, these books. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, this is a brand new series, um, and uh, this is going to be our fifth and sixth books that I've preached through in the past five years. We started out in 1 Corinthians, went to Luke, then Jonah, then Exodus, and then we're going to be in 1 and 2 Timothy uh, now. And uh, anytime we start a new book series, I think it's always important or a good idea to kind of do an introduction, if you will, to the events and the circumstances surrounding that book. Uh, so it's, it's really a good thing that you're here this morning because a lot of this material is going to kind of guide uh, how we're going to interpret and understand this book and, uh, over the next year or so. So here's how I want to structure the sermon this morning. I want to ask five questions, very, very, very simple questions. Who, what, when, where, and why of surrounding this book, and then I'm going to give us one point of application at the end. Okay, so that's where we're going this morning. So let's begin with the who. Of course, if we're writing, uh, studying a book about Timothy, that raises this huge question of who. Who is Timothy? All right, well, Timothy's name is actually mentioned in 26 different verses in the New Testament. Now, the very first place that we see Timothy's name mentioned is Acts chapter 16. So let's read that. It tells us who Timothy was. It'll be on the screen for you, okay? Here it is. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, we learn five things about Timothy here from this passage in Acts. Number one, he's a disciple. Two, he's half Jew, half Greek, or half Gentile. Three, his mother is a Christian. Four, he's well spoken of. And five, he traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys. So I want to look at those individually. All right, number one, Timothy is a disciple. The Greek word that's used there is mathetes. It's the exact same word used of the original 12 disciples, Peter, James, John, all of them. All right, same word. Uh, and basically, the, it's interesting that uh, Paul gives this, to, uh, uh, or Luke and Acts gives this description of Timothy, uh, mathetes, 
Because a disciple is essentially just an apprentice, a student. That's what a disciple is. Someone who sits under teaching and learns. And we're left to believe that Timothy is a disciple of Jesus. Not one of the original 12, but he is a disciple of Jesus. Two, he's half Jew, half Greek. His mother is Jewish and his father is a Gentile. Most likely, though, he would have been considered a Jew. Here's why. According to later rabbinic law, a child born to a Jewish mother and a Greek father was considered to be Jewish. The marriage of a Jewish woman to a non-Jew was considered a non-legal marriage. And in all instances of non-legal marriages, the lineage of the child was reckoned through the mother. So because of this, before Paul takes him on his missionary journeys, he has Timothy circumcised. His, remember, his father is a Gentile, and, and, and normally you would follow the customs of your dad, so his dad, being a Gentile, would not have had his son circumcised. Paul knows this, so he has Timothy circumcised. Now, why does he do that? Uh, because that's interesting, because Paul had already preached to the Galatians that there's no need to be circumcised. Remember, there's these Judaizers in Galatia that are saying that the new believers have to get circumcised, and Paul says, you don't have to get circumcised to be saved. In fact, you must not get circumcised so that you don't submit to the law. So why does Paul have Timothy circumcised? Keep in mind that the issue of circumcision in Galatians dealt with Gentiles, that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. But there's no evidence that the Jews didn't still practice this. We have all reason to believe that the Jews continue to practice this ritual. I think Paul has Timothy circumcised because he's abiding by his own teaching in 1 Corinthians 9.20, where he says, To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. I think that this is a missionary strategy by Paul to not hamper his effectiveness or Timothy's effectiveness. All right, if you're like, well, how would they know? Well, not to get crass, but they, in those days, they, they showered together and naked. And so they would find out. Okay, so I think this is a missionary strategy that Paul is using to not hamper his effectiveness in the gospel. All right. Number three, his mother is a Christian. Luke says that his mother was a believer. Now, we will learn later that not only was his mother a Christian, but so is his grandmother. Second Timothy 1 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And we're definitely led to believe that Timothy came to faith through the witness of his mother and his grandmother. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, But as for you, continue what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It would appear that Lois and Eunice have taught their grandson and son the faith. They taught them the scriptures and brought him to the faith. Now, Mother's Day is coming up in a few weeks. So let me just pause for just a moment. A lot of times this is passage is preached on Mother's Day in 2 Timothy. Uh, let me just pause for just a moment to say, um, fathers, mothers, you have no greater responsibility, no greater privilege than to teach your child the faith. You have no greater responsibility and no greater privilege. Um, I know that many of our kids are still young, you know, and they're still like in the infancy. And, but here's the thing. As they get older, there are going to be many days that you often feel like, what am I doing? Like, it, is this even working? Is, is telling them these Bible stories over? Is this, is this even making a difference? I know my wife wrestles with that every day of her life. And you will too. Let me encourage you with the witness of Lois and Eunice and give you a resounding yes. You are making a difference in the life of your child. You will make a difference in the life of your child. I mean, think about it. We have no idea who Lois and Eunice are. We have no idea what they did. We have no idea if they ever did anything great in their life. But we know much about what Timothy did. 
and how many people came to faith through Timothy. And that started with Lois and Eunice. Even if you don't have biological children or adoptive children, or even if God, you never have children, I have good news for you. I have good news for you. When you got saved, you got adopted into an enormous family. And you have 40, 50, 60 children over there, next door, some of them here. You know, and it's very easy to think when you're teaching Sunday school or you're serving in VBS, or maybe if you're just sitting on the couch with them eating candy, which I know some like to do. <laughs> you know, it's very easy to think, are they getting these Bible stories? Are they, are they learning anything? Is this even working? Is there even a point to this? It's very easy, children's ministry, to kind of feel like, is, is, is this even worthwhile? It's very easy to feel that way in children's ministry. Paul told Timothy that the sacred writings that his grandmother and his mother had taught him from his youth were able to make him wise for salvation. So listen to me. Don't worry if you think your teaching is in vain. Don't worry if you think your methods are not being effective. Don't worry if you think the children aren't listening. I tell myself that every Sunday morning. The power lies not in your teaching. The power lies not in your methods. The power lies not even in their ears. The power lies in the word. So give them the word. Give children the word. The greatest gift that you can give a child, whether it's your legal child or a child next door, the greatest gift that you can give a child is the word consistently taught to them. It's the greatest thing you can ever give a child. Four, Timothy is well spoken of. We don't know more than that. He has a good reputation, basically. Doesn't say anything further than that. And five, he traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys. Luke says that Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Now, what did Timothy do on these journeys? Well, he started off being a helper. Acts 19, having sent to Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus. All right, so Timothy starts off being a helper to Paul. There is value in being a helper. All right, you don't have to be a Paul. You can be a helper to Paul. You can be a Timothy. Later, Paul mentioned him on several occasions as a co-laborer in Christ. Romans 16, Timothy, my fellow worker. 1 Corinthians 16, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. 1 Thessalonians 3, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in the faith. You know, we often give Paul all the credit. We often talk about Paul. He gets all the credit for everything that we see in the New Testament. But let's not forget the work of Barnabas, Titus, John Mark, Epaphroditus, Lydia, Dorcas, Phoebe, Silas, and Timothy. Don't forget Dorcas. Paul is only as good as his team. He's only as good as the team that surrounds him. Paul became so united with Timothy that he even listed him as a co-sender in six of his letters. 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, both Thessalonians and Philemon. When he writes his letters, he says, not just Paul, but Paul and Timothy. He's a co-sender. And because Paul had spent so much time with Timothy, he had grown such an affection for Timothy, he even considered him a son. Look at 1 Timothy 1, 2. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. And on four other occasions, Paul calls him a son in the faith. 1 Corinthians 4. This is why I sent to you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. 
2 Timothy 1, to Timothy, my beloved child. And perhaps the most endearing passage, or at least my favorite one, is Philippians 2. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Paul wants to send Timothy to Philippians. Why? So that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek out their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy. You know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I ask my boys probably at least once a week, hey guys, what do you want to do when you grow up? You want to be a pastor? Like, like daddy? They're like, no, firefighter. And I'm like, okay. Like, well, what if you're not a firefighter? A, a pastor? No, a policeman. And I'm just like, okay, I'll just have to, I guess I'll get over that. You know, you know there, there would be no greater joy. I would love to, to, to be serving in ministry one day with my kids. There would be no greater joy than to serve in ministry with your child or children. We don't know if Paul had any biological children. Probably not. We're led to believe that he probably didn't have any biological children. But Timothy has become his son in the faith. He had become his son in the faith. And not only a son, but a son that faithfully worked beside him. And like father, like son, if Hebrews 13, 23 is referring to prison, it would appear that Timothy followed in his father's footsteps. Hebrews 13, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Paul had impacted Timothy so much that Timothy was willing to endure persecution and suffering and imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. He is following in his father's footsteps. So that's a brief synopsis of who was Timothy? That's who Timothy is. Now what? Second question, what is 1 Timothy? When we read the Bible, you know, we often think of these as books, and rightfully so, they are. You know, the Bible is one book comprised of many books. Uh, but keep in mind that 1 Timothy was and is a letter. It was a letter. This is a real person, Paul, writing a real letter to a real person, Timothy. All right? It was originally written on parchment. There wasn't a, a, a real letter that he wrote down and sealed it, and delivered it, and opened it, and read it. This was, there was a real letter that was written. Now, despite this being a letter from one individual to another individual, I want to make sure that we don't think that the application of this is only to Timothy. All right? If you've, not, if you've ever not done a study on this or read this, you're like, well, this is about Timothy. It's not about me. No. These commands and truths that Paul is giving to Timothy do not just apply to Timothy and Timothy alone. These letters are the inspired word of God. They were given as instructions to the early church and to us. We often call 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, all three books together, the pastoral epistles. You ever hear, you ever see a P and an E? That's pastoral epistles. Or um, uh, if you ever hear me say pastoral epistles, that's what they are. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. The early church was already using these letters as a guide for their ecclesiastical uh, practice and guidelines and discipline. They looked to these letters by Paul to know how to do church, if you will. So even though this letter is addressed to Timothy, Paul gives instructions in the letter to the church as a whole. He gives instructions to women, to overseers, to elders, to deacons, to slaves, to old and young men alike, and so on. Much of what we do at CSBC, much of what we do in church practice, worship, discipline, and so on in the church is guided and founded upon what we see in the pastoral epistles. And this is important. This is very important. Why? Because there, there are a lot of churches out there today that are kind of just making up things as they go along. Just kind of Figure it out as we go along. Um, and here's, here's the problem. There's a lot of controversial material in this book. You can look at the back of your bulletin and after the sermon and uh, see how much controversial material is in these books. And so the danger is we have to balance between two truths here. Here they are. A, the freedom of the Spirit, and B, the authority of the Word. 
Like, we're going to have this challenge over the next year of having to discern when does the Bible not give an authoritative word on this, and we can have freedom in the Spirit. And when does this depart from freedom and conflict with the authority of the word? So I want to say at the get-go of this series that my desire as a pastor is that we would live out both of those truths, that we would strive to live out both of those truths, to be spirit-led, to live in the freedom of the spirit, and to not be dogmatic about things that maybe we shouldn't be dogmatic about, but to also be submissive to the word and the authority of the word and uh, to treat this letter as the word of God. And that's, that's a hard balance to maintain, all right? But you, you have my commitment as your pastor that I will strive imperfectly to balance those two, okay? When? When was, next question, when was this letter written? Now, there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of debate as to, and disagreement on when these dates. So I'm gonna give a brief timeline, all right, very brief. This is by no means the only timeline. It's by no means the only correct one or, you know, so here it is. Um, Jesus is crucified and resurrected in 30 or 33. Those are the two possibilities. You could choose either one based on the dating, all right? 30 or 33, Jesus is crucified. About a year later, Paul is saved, about 33, 34. Uh, several years later, Paul goes on his first missionary journey in 46 or 47. All right. Very shortly after that, 48 or 49 to 51, Paul goes on his second missionary journey. Now, on the second missionary journey is where Timothy joins him. All right. So Timothy is on the second one. Several years later, 52 to 57, Paul goes on his third missionary journey. Paul took three missionary journeys. All right. Then in 62... Paul, remember, he's on trial. He appeals to Caesar. And because he appeals to Caesar, he's got to go to Rome. And, and while he's in Rome, he's under house arrest. So in 62, Paul's under house arrest in Rome. You can read about that in Acts 28, uh, at the end of Acts 28. Paul is under house arrest in Rome for about two years. So 62 to 64. Finally, Paul is released. While he's released, he conducts ministry, and it's during this time that he writes 1 Timothy while free. So Paul is not in prison while he's writing 1 Timothy. He's roaming about freely as he's writing this. However, he's arrested again around the same time, 62 to 64, and then he writes 2 Timothy while in prison. So he's free in 1 Timothy, he's imprisoned in 2 Timothy. All right, And then about... A year to three years later, Paul is martyred in Rome, around 64 to 67. Most people think perhaps under uh, Domitian, maybe Nero, it's hard to know. But Paul is martyred around this time. So this letter, that 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, are written with like one to three years left of his life. This is at the end of Paul's life. Timothy is still a young man, but this is at the end of his life. This letter is about 30 years after the death of Jesus. Roughly. All right, so 30 years have passed since the death of Jesus. All right, where? Next question. From where and to where was this letter written? Um, we are not told exactly where Paul is when he's writing this letter. We're not told. Remember, they've been, he's been released from house arrest in Rome. He's traveling freely. Uh, many scholars think that he's in Macedonia when he writes this. Look at uh, chap, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia. So it's perhaps that he made it to Macedonia. Many scholars think that's the case. If Titus and 1 Timothy are written around the same time, many scholars think so, he may have been at Nicopolis. He's at Nicopolis when he writes Titus. So if he wrote him at the same time, he's at Nicopolis. We know that Timothy is in Ephesus. Look at verse 3. He says, remain at Ephesus. So we know Timothy is in Ephesus when he received the letter. I'm going to show you a map up here that Eric's going to pull up. All right, here is modern, if you were to walk, all right, on Google Maps, all right, here is where, um, if you can see over here, here's Nicopolis over here. This is modern day Greece. All of this area is Macedonia. All right, this is Ephesus over here. This is modern day Turkey over here. All right, Ephesus is in modern day Turkey. Uh, Nicopolis, Macedonia is modern day Greece. So, and they would have had to sail around. They can't, obviously, there's no ferries. They have to sail around 
uh, to get there. So that's kind of an idea of where we're dealing with, all right? Greece and Turkey is, is, is where this is happening, okay? Just wanted you to kind of get a context of where this is. Um, this letter is going to Timothy, but the church that Paul is going to reference all throughout First and Second Timothy is Ephesus, all right? So anytime you hear the church in its immediate context, it's Ephesus, the same church in Ephesians, all right? So they're the same church. Why? Why was this letter written? Um, if, last question, if we were to read 1 Timothy, I think we would ascertain three main purposes as to why this letter is written, for why Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. Here they are. Number one, to deal with false teaching. Uh, look at chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. All right? So uh, there's some false teaching going on. We're going to discuss that next week when we talk about doctrine and false teaching. Uh, but this was an issue in Paul's day. It's still an issue in today's culture. And this is important. Why? Because there's a trend that's been going on for quite some time now in our Christian culture. It is gaining momentum and speed. It has not slowed down. And here's the trend. And, the Christ and this is a trend in Christian culture the trend is we should not focus on doctrine. We shouldn't focus on doctrine. Doctrine is divisive. Doctrine is dogmatic. Doctrine is dull. I'm trying to think of all the D words I could think of. I started to say, no, I was going to say. You know, and I spent the day on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, listening uh, and reading pastors, um, some of the largest churches in America, and there was one thing missing from almost all of them. Doctrine. It was very self-help. Very much about, you know, here are principles to have a better marriage. Here are principles for your bank account. Here are principles uh, to live a better life. Right? And those aren't bad things. They're not bad. Those aren't bad things to focus on. But here's why it's important. It would be like if you went to airplane pilot school. And when you got there, the teachers were teaching you how to have better finances and how to have a better marriage. And you would say, don't we need to learn how to fly the plane? I mean, I'm really thankful that you're teaching me about how to have a better marriage and better finances. But if I don't learn how to fly the plane, won't people die? Don't we need to get that right first and predominantly? Now, don't get me wrong. We can be on one extreme or the other. We can be so doctrinally sound that we're no missionally or compassionately good. All right? That's for sure. If we're failing to put our doctrine into practice, our doctrine matters not. It doesn't matter at all. It does not matter to you if I can quote love your neighbor as yourself in Greek and give you quotes about what John Calvin said about that verse and can give you a theological defense of what love means. None of that matters if I don't actually love my neighbor as myself. None of that matters. Let's get that straight. But the answer to that extreme is not to throw away doctrine to not focus on doctrine. Because the moment we get away from solid, robust doctrine, we are in danger of false teaching. Now here's the danger of false teaching. Here's the greatest danger of false teaching. False teaching never starts off looking like false teaching. No Christian wakes up one day and says, man, Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. Man, homosexuality is permissible. Well, speaking of, adultery is permissible. No Christian wakes up one day and just believes that out of thin air. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy to encourage him and to command him to deal with false teaching going on at Ephesus. And Paul says, this is important, Timothy. We'll see later in the letter that Paul told Timothy, Jason can quote this, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. That's the same word for doctrine. Why? Persist in this. 
for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul doesn't tell Timothy, Timothy, go love people. Go serve people, as important as those things are. Those things are massively important. But Paul says, keep a close watch on your doctrine, Timothy. Because by doing this, you will save yourself and your hearers. Next week, we will talk about the sermon title is, Why Doctrine Matters. So, if you don't like doctrine, show up next week. I'll prove to you why it matters. And you can decide if you want to believe me. Second reason he wrote this letter. To give principles for Christian conduct. Uh, we're going to see that Paul is going to give principles for how Christians should behave. Uh, things such as, who should we pray for? You know, should we be praying for Donald Trump? We should. Bernie Sanders? I don't mean like supporting Donald Trump. I meant like, you should pray for all the candidates. Should we be praying for Obama? We should. How should a woman dress? Do you wear pearls today, ladies? It's a joke. It's a joke. You can wear pearls. What should older men and women be doing? What should younger men and women be doing? What about widows? How do we live with money? And on and on. You know, the thing I love about the Bible is that sometimes Jesus tells us things and it's hard to know, okay, how do I put that in practice? Jesus says, don't love money. You cannot love money. And I'm like, okay, how do I apply that? What do I do with that? And Paul is helpful because Paul writes to Timothy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to give us commands and principles about how we live with money. What, what's our takeaway? How do, we, how, do, how do I deal with making this kind of money? Paul's going to help us out on that. All right? And the third reason he's writing this letter is to give principles for church practice. Paul's going to give principles to Timothy to deliver to the church at Ephesus regarding church practice. Instructions for like overseers and overseers' families. What are the qualifications to be an overseer? Elders, deacons, deacons' wives. What is an overseer, elder, deacon supposed to be devoted to? How are they supposed to spend their time? What is the church's responsibility when it comes to widows? What is the church's responsibility when it comes to paying ministers? What is the church's responsibility when it comes to church discipline? These are all questions that this letter is going to tackle. And, and, and so how do we do church practice? And as I said earlier, this is important because there are many churches today that are simply just making things up as they go. Figuring it out as we go. Now, as Southern Baptist. We are sola scriptura proponents, which is Latin for scripture alone. If you ever hear that sola scriptura, you, it's so we sound educated. That's why we say it like that. Scripture alone, all right? That's what we are proponents of, meaning that we strive to not make church up as we go. The foundation of what we do in the church is the word of God. We look to the Word of God. Does God say anything about this? All right? Now, I'm not saying we're perfect. We're not. No church is. I mean, the whole reason we have denominations is because we disagree on this. But we strive as Southern Baptists to not just figure out, okay, how do we want to do church? Like, but to what does God say about how we should do church? We look to Jesus, to Paul, the apostles, of how we should do this. So that's a who, what, when, where, and why synopsis of 1 Timothy. Now, what's our application to all of that? Well, the letter of 1 and 2 Timothy, they, they only exist because of 1 Timothy 1-2, when Paul says to Timothy, my true child in the faith. These two letters are letters from a father to his son. These letters only exist because of Acts 16.4. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. I mean, you have to wonder, did Timothy realize how much his life was going to change when Paul said, hey, do you want to come with me on the missionary journey? Timothy went from being a youth 
who was a Christian. Z, this is how your life can change. Right here. He went from a youth being a Christian to being a helper to the most important missionary in the history of the world to being a delegate, an apostle of this missionary, to being entrusted with churches, broken churches, to being imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. That's the life you can have. <laughs> and all of you can have. And all of that is possible because of the relationship Frank has. <laughs> no. All of that is possible because of the relationship that Paul started with Timothy. Paul met this young man whom he saw a lot of potential in and said, come with me on these journeys. So one point of application. Don't ever underemphasize the role of a father and a mother. Let me give four categories of people there, okay? Don't misunderstand that. Four categories of people this morning. Number one, if you are a legal parent, meaning you have biological children or adoptive children, Lois and Eunice are proof that your influence, your upbringing, your teaching, your discipling your children matter, eternally matter. We are absolutely left to believe that Timothy came to faith through the witness of his grandmother and mother. We're left to believe that. And how many people came to faith through Timothy? We don't know anything about Lois and Eunice. Maybe Lois and Eunice never did another thing in their life except bring their son and grandson to the faith. And look at what Timothy did. He impacted thousands, maybe millions. And yes, there's no guarantee that bringing your child up in the faith will, will make them saved. There's no guarantee for that, right? You can grow up in a Christian family and walk away from the faith. There's no guarantee for that. But that's not a reason not to try, all right? Why? Why? Because that's like saying if you're bleeding to death and I come up upon you and I say, well, I'm not going to put a tourniquet on you because there's no guarantee that that will save your life. No! No! There's nothing more important to do right then and there than to put a tourniquet on them. And they might die, but at least I'm going to do everything I can to save you. Now just, that's in a 30-minute episode. Expand that over 30 years. There's nothing more important you can do if God blesses you with legal children than to teach your child the faith. Nothing. It's more important than education, getting a good job, getting married, having grandchildren. There's nothing more important you can do as a legal parent than teach your child the faith. Two, spiritual parent. If you don't have any legal children to be, to be a parent, or God never gives you children, again, good news. Paul wasn't Timothy's biological father. He wasn't his adoptive father either. Five times in the New Testament, though, Paul refers to Timothy as his son. He had become his father in the faith. Jesus promised us that when we get saved, we inherit a family. Not just eternal life, but a family. And that family doesn't start in heaven. It starts now. That family is not just brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not just brothers and sisters in Christ. It also includes mothers and fathers and daughters and sons. So I, I want, hear me out when I say this, okay? I'm going to say something that's going to cut across culture. And I realize I'm speaking against thousands of years of culture here. Because the Chinese culture has been around forever. I'm going to hear me out. The picture we see in the New Testament is that the spiritual family you are grafted into is in some sense, not every sense, is in some sense more important than your family through biology. I could give you verse after verse to, to, to testify to that. The spiritual family 
you are grafted into is more important, not because, because Jesus is more important, than your family through biology. In some sense, not every sense, I realize I'm working against thousands of years of culture. But Jesus predates that. Jesus was there before China. Timothy became who he was because Paul became his father in the faith. Spiritual child, third category. If you're here and you're a spiritual child, learn from your spiritual father and mother. And keep learning. Keep learning until the day you are ready and equipped to be a spiritual father and mother to somebody else. We saw earlier in the timeline that from the time that Paul met Timothy to the time that he writes this letter is 10 to 15 years. That means that 10 to 15 years later, Timothy is still taking instructions from Paul. Timothy wasn't like, hey man, I've been a Christian for 10, 15 years. I got it. He's still taking instruction from his spiritual father. That's what a disciple does. A disciple, by definition, is a learner. Are you a disciple? Are you? Here's the reality. You ever consider that we will spend 17 to 20 years, sometimes more, in the education system? Spending thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours studying and test taking and projects and exams. Sometimes spending thousands upon thousands of dollars all to get a job. Sometimes not even that great of a job. I have friends who have master's degrees and they're working at Kmart. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. Please hear me when I say that. I don't mean that in any way the negative. I'm just saying that uh, we will spend 17 to 20 years of our life and thousands of hours of time and money to get a job. Sometimes a job you don't even like. Isn't spending five, six, seven years being discipled by somebody, or even just one or two years, worth your eternity? Isn't just spending a, a fraction of that time worth your eternity? And not just your eternity, but the eternity of others. Have you ever considered that discipleship is not just about you? You might think, well, I got this which be careful with that. That's like me getting behind a Boeing 747, being like, don't worry, guys, I got this. You ever consider that discipleship is not just about your eternity, but the eternity of others that you will go and disciple? See, the, the reason you disciple someone is not just for them. It's for the people that they will disciple and that those people will disciple. That's the system. Paul trained Timothy, but not just for Timothy, for the people that Timothy would train. Paul said, in 2 Timothy, we're going to see that. He says, I left you in Crete so that you may raise up leaders. And the fourth category, last one, neither. If you're here this morning and you say, look, I don't have any legal children. I don't have a spiritual father or mother. I'm not a spiritual father or mother. I don't fall in any category. Right? I want to give you a very, very gentle and loving challenge. And I mean this with utmost love for you. People don't just become missionaries. People don't just become pastors. People don't just become Christian writers. People don't just become Christian businessmen and businesswomen. People don't just become faithful servants of God. None of that happens by osmosis. None of that happens by attending church. None of that happens by simply reading your Bible on your own. Those things happen in the context, almost always, of discipleship. Almost always. That's how Jesus did it. That's how Paul did it. 
Have you ever considered that Jesus didn't just walk up to the disciples and say, here you go, Peter, here's the Old Testament, read it, put it in practice. And on Sunday, come hear me preach. It's not what Jesus did. He lived life with them. He taught them. He ate with them. He ministered to them. He ministered with them. He sent them out. The same goes for Paul with Timothy. Paul took Timothy with him on his journey. Some of us need to go and be a spiritual father or mother to somebody. We do. Stop protecting me time or Netflix time or workaholic time. Stop protecting that time and go and disciple somebody. Some of us need to seek out a spiritual mother or father. Seek somebody out. And listen, whenever I hear this, the immediate criticism I hear is, well, we don't have that older age group in our church. We really don't have the, the, the people that could be a spiritual father or mother to us. Listen, if I can be frank, and I mean this in the most loving of ways, we've got to stop giving that excuse. I would love if we had 20 men in their 50s and 60s who were still, who had been saved for decades, were still doing the work of ministry and were still madly in love with Jesus. I would love if we had 20 women in their 50s and 60s who had been saved for decades, were still doing the work of ministry and were madly still in love with Jesus. I would love it if we had that, but we don't. We have to do the best with what God has given us. We have to. So I want to challenge you. If you're ready to pour into somebody, seek somebody out and pour into them. Just choose one person and pour into them. Like Paul is doing with Timothy. If you're not ready, if you're like, look, I'm not ready, then seek somebody out to pour into you. Start with one person. And listen, here's the best news too. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to be a Christian to do this. You do on the giving end, you do. But on the receiving end, you don't. If you're not a Christian and you want to know more about Christianity, guess what? We want to tell you. We want to meet with you. I think 12 of my most favorite words as a pastor, I mean this when I say this, these are 12 of my most favorite words as a pastor to hear. I'm not a Christian, but I want to know more about Christianity. I love it. Great. When can we meet? If you are a Christian, you don't have to only meet with Christians. If there is a non-Christian who is willing to actually meet with you and listen to what you have to say, then meet with them. Clear your schedule and meet with them. If you have a lost person that is willing to meet with you, clear your schedule and meet with them. And disciple them into the kingdom. If God permits. He might, he might not permit it, but at least Let's be diligent to make an effort. I would not be saved if my mother and father didn't teach me the faith. I'm convinced of that. If I grew up in a Buddhist family, I'd probably right now be hungover on Sunday morning from partying last night at age 34, probably. Or divorced or who knows. And I know many of you didn't grow up with that, but you had somebody share the faith with you. I would not be a pastor if my college pastor didn't disciple me. We'd go to the, go get coffee and talk about everything, mainly girls. No, that was a lot of what we talked about. My college pastor was willing to pour into me for two years of his life. He poured into me. I am confident I would not be a pastor if he didn't disciple me, I would be the nominal church attender who just shows up on Sunday morning and does nothing else. That's who I would be. I'm convinced of that. 
There are people in your life that will not get there apart from somebody pouring into them like Paul did to Timothy. That depends on you and me. Don't ever underemphasize the role of a father and a mother, legal or spiritual. Be a Paul to a Timothy or be a Timothy to a Paul. Either one. 